When gone I am, the last of the Jedi you will be. These parting words are from the legendary Grandmaster Yoda of the Old Jedi Order spoken to Luke Skywalker on his deathbed in the year 4 ABY. But with recent canonical changes, retcons, and inclusions, this line doesn't really make sense anymore. Or does it? Originally, this line was an actual representation of the truth, which is that Luke would have been the literal last Jedi from that point forward, once Yoda took his final breath. But just like with the original meeting of Obi-Wan telling Luke that Vader murdered his father, we now have to say that Yoda, what he said is true from a certain point of view. Yoda does know about the other Force-sensitive wielders in the galaxy who call themselves Jedi, or at least ally with them. This feels like a strange choice at first though, as one might think that Yoda would be overjoyed to have more Jedi in the galaxy rather than rejecting them. However, not as all as it seems, and after taking a closer look at all the new canon sources about the post-purge Jedi, we can firmly give a reason why Yoda still considered Luke to be the only Jedi left. So let's open a holocron and get right in. The very first question we need to get out of the way up front is, did Yoda even know about the other Jedi? He was confined to Dagobah since the Purge, and as far as we know, he has not left the planet in all the years of his exile. He has little to no technology, no outside sources, and no contacts. But despite all of this, the answer is yes. Yoda was fully aware of the active Jedi of this time. You see, it has been made clear that through Rebels, that Yoda was aware of Kanan and Jarrus and Ezra due to him visiting them twice speaking to them on the Jedi Temple of Lothal when they went through their trials, and Yoda even made himself appear briefly to Ahsoka as well. Also in the canon anthology book, A Certain Point of View, there is a short story literally labeled There is Another, where it reveals that Yoda had frequent communications with Obi-Wan through the Force. While not stated directly in this story, we believe that Obi-Wan told Yoda of any other Jedi that he came across, which of course was Ezra Bridger, as Obi-Wan would have heard about Cal Kestis on the Holonet news as well. But Kenobi did actually meet Ezra in person. Even if Ben didn't tell Yoda anything about the other Jedi, we saw how Yoda is able to throw his consciousness through the Force into the Jedi temples around the galaxy. We know that Cal spent a lot of his time exploring Jedi ruins, so it's also entirely plausible that Yoda was aware of him as well. So now, we get into the actual question. If Yoda was willing to help them out, then why didn't he consider them Jedi along with Luke? This comes from a multitude of reasons, three in particular. The first one is that both Obi-Wan and Master Yoda are stuck in the old ways of the Jedi. We can go ahead and say this to begin, but Ahsoka doesn't identify as a Jedi by her own choice. Even though among all the active Force wielders, Ahsoka meets the definition of a Jedi best. However, Kenobi and Yoda respected the sentiment. But Kanan, Cal, and Ezra are what Balin Skull identified as Boken Jedi, a new term, which he explains to mean Jedi of a breed that were trained after the Purge by other Jedi survivors. It's very likely that while Yoda appreciates their devotion to the light side and the way of the Jedi, he doesn't consider them to be authentic Jedi since they were not trained by the established structure. The Jedi Order follows a very specific set of proceedings when it came to training the next generation. Without those proper proceedings, or mentors who know what the Jedi are doing, Vulcan Jedi can be ignorant of the true Jedi way and may not fully represent the Jedi as they need to be represented in the eyes of Yoda. Ezra specifically falls into this category, whereas Cal and Kanan ride this line, since they began their training as Padawans but were never officially knighted. Both of these Vulcan Jedi were extremely young and had rudimentary knowledge of the Force, lightsaber combat, as well as what it meant to be a Jedi. Cal would go on a journey after losing most of his Force abilities, visiting Jedi ruins and Force-filled tombs to regain his power and connection to the Force through raw experience. Not to mention, he had Seer's help in finding and using Jedi holocrons. The completion and knighting of Kane and Jarrus would be complete when he used the Jedi holocron in his possession, work with the Bendu, and learn from the visions granted to him by the Lothal Jedi Temple. This is where he overcame his weaknesses and was knighted at the feet of a temple guard. However, his knighting ceremony wasn't by a true Jedi master, rather a vision and a vision on a sect of a Jedi that Kanan didn't even belong to. While we might give him the benefit of the doubt, and say that the Force knighted Kanan through the temple, we are going based on Yoda's thought, not our own logic. Also, Kanan took Ezra on as a Padawan despite still being a Padawan himself. A big taboo to be sure, but not to mention, Ezra very clearly has a lot of gaps in his knowledge and discipline. 
He got as far as he did based on raw potential, even though Kanan did his best. But on the subject of Jedi Knights, that brings us to another truth we must face from Yoda's perspective, which is that he carries a much higher standard for what he considers to be a true knight. In fact, according to Yoda, one isn't even considered a Jedi at all until they're a knight. Let's look at some more dialogue in the same scene. On his bed, Yoda says this, No more training do you require. Already have what you need. Luke in awe then responds, then I am a Jedi. Yoda opens his eyes and actually laughs at him before saying this, not yet, one thing remains. That's when Yoda tells Luke that in order to become a Jedi Knight, he must confront Vader. This falls in line with the fact that in order to complete their training and become a knight, Padawans must overcome the Jedi trials or be tested by a significant challenge that would test them in all the same ways that the trial would have, such as defeating a Sith. Since Yoda had no way of putting Luke through the trials, then there's only one way for him to become a knight and complete his destiny, to defeat Vader. Yoda finishes by saying, then, only then, a Jedi will you be. So here, we see Yoda's acknowledging that Luke's training is finished, and there's nothing left to teach him. But Yoda knows Luke is now not only competent, but fully capable in the Force, which means he doesn't doubt Luke's knowledge or skills. Neither does he doubt the skills of Ezra, Kanan, Ahsoka, or Cal Kestis. Yet, Yoda cannot verify that they have overcome the necessary challenges needed to be officially knighted. In fact, this could even be Yoda's way of telling Luke that since he's now the only Jedi, he can now knight the others as well. But even if he doesn't require an official knighting ceremony, there is something to be said about Yoda and how he might feel about Bokan Jedi methods. More specifically, how they display the Jedi ideals of protection of life. And that is to say, none of them other than Luke display the proper amount of the sanctity of life. All of these Jedi have a bone to pick with the Empire because of what they suffered at the hands of the new regime. However, Luke seems to be the only one out of this group who treats the idea of taking a life seriously. Cal and Ezra are seen slaughtering hordes of stormtroopers while cracking jokes the whole time. Ahsoka has abandoned the ways of the Jedi for a while and did things the rough way if she deemed it necessary. While Kanan isn't objectively shown taking pleasure in killing, he doesn't stay his blade very often at all. In fact, he had to be taught by the Bendu how to be at peace with the spiders on Adalon. This is not to say that the taking of life isn't a part of the Jedi way. That would be a lie. Qui-Gon, who was known for exclusively listening to the will of the Force, had no issues taking a life if that was what the Force willed him to do. The Force is life, and therefore has the authority to give it and take it away as desired. The Jedi are simply the conduits of that will, again according to Qui-Gon and the ancient Jedi doctrine. In fact, the very weapon that they use, the lightsaber, is engineered specifically to give their enemies a quick and merciful death should the time arise. But that time should not be every moment that they face opposition. He will try everything in his arsenal of tricks and tactics before using his lightsaber. It is only when Luke knows that his situation cannot be resolved any other way does he resort to deadly force. In Jabba's palace, Luke went in completely unarmed and navigated using his Jedi mind tricks as well as clever manipulation. Luke did try to shoot Jabba with a blaster, but that was because Luke sensed that the hut was pure evil and had murderous intent. We know that Luke sensed this because later on, he would refuse to fight Vader, sensing the conflict within him. Luke would even outright state that he didn't believe Vader would destroy him. I do want to state that none of this is to say that Cal, Kanan, or Ezra are bloodthirsty murderers. They do value life as the entire reason that they go on these rampages against the Empire is protecting the innocent. Ezra, though, almost fell to the dark side because of how the Empire treated his parents and his people on Lothal. They have not truly ascended to what it means to be a true true Jedi. They don't show the regard for their enemies, and very rarely seek a peaceful route around the opposition unless it's valuable to a mission to maintain a low profile. The only credit we can give for Kanan and Ezra is that they at least show mercy when asked and don't double tap if their enemies are down. We can't really say that for Cal Kestis though, and I think it is worth mentioning that the reason all of them act like this is because they are at war with the Empire. It's not like they're doing this out of emotion, but often necessity. But again, the point from Yoda's perspective still stands. In the end, the final point to wrap up all of this is our fourth secret reason. Almost everyone mentioned was out of commission by the time of Return of the Jedi, and Yoda didn't know when or if they would ever return. 
both Obi-Wan and Kanan Jarrus were dead, Ezra Bridger vanished to the unknown regions and outside of the galaxy, so Yoda could no longer sense him. We still don't know where Cal is during this time period, so we'll have to count him as MIA. And the same thing goes for Ahsoka. Though again, she didn't claim herself as a Jedi, so neither did Yoda. As far as the rest of Order 66 survivors, they had all given up and were in hiding for the most part. I think the last thing to talk about here is whether Yoda was right in his opinion. It's complicated because he is the Jedi Grand Master, and if anyone should know what constitutes a real Jedi, it would be him. But again, it was this kind of thinking that cost the Jedi Order their lives in the first place. With all the information we stated in this video, here is a rebuttal. The times have changed, and the Jedi under the Empire need to conform to the new ways. The old ways failed, and the Order is gone. Yoda even admitted that the failure of the Jedi was his fault, and that he had grown out of touch. Yoda was too arrogant and blind to see what the Jedi were becoming, and yet he continued to make the same mistakes even after. Both Yoda and Obi-Wan made a mistake when they told Luke not to protect his friends on Bespin. They also said that Vader could not be redeemed. This is the whole story of Star Wars, that in the end, it was Luke. The new generation of the Jedi was right, and the old ways were wrong. The Jedi had chosen Luke because he was raised in a normal life, and they expected him to commit an act that would be indicative of a Jedi raised in the temple. Luke was raised with a family that loved him dearly, but then the Jedi expected him to kill his own father after keeping the truth from him. In the end, the story is that Luke was right and the Jedi Masters were not. Luke's Jedi Order continued to reflect that value of the sanctity of life, all while the Boken Jedi are forced to conform to the new times of war. The Empire would not hesitate to kill any Jedi or those that they loved. The Jedi were forced to take on more cutthroat ideals, otherwise they'd be found and destroyed. It may not be the envisioned Jedi way, but that was life in a galaxy ruled by the Sith. Despite their rougher decisions, none of these Boken Jedi fell to the dark side, and the public image of the Jedi was ten times more improved than it was originally. They may have lacked some knowledge of the Force and the Jedi way, but they made up through it with experience, the same way that Luke did. It is unfair that it is expected that they be knighted by a Jedi Master, and even more unfair that it's the Grand Master. So here, we decided to give you both sides of the argument, why Yoda said this, and why he ultimately may have been mistaken. But now my friends, what are your thoughts on this? Why do you believe that Yoda called Luke the only Jedi, or the last Jedi? And why do you think he didn't count the others as Jedi themselves? And ultimately, was he wrong? Thank you as always so much for visiting the channel today, my friends, and may the Force be with you.